First Peter chapter one, beginning at verse ten, reading uh, to verse to verse twelve. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner. First Peter one ten, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So Peter has already stated, let me refresh your memory for a moment as I introduce our study. He's already uh, stated that we are kept by God's power through faith for salvation. He had said that in verse 5 of this chapter. So believers, he was saying, are under the watchful care of God, who, who is the one who secures our inheritance. And so God's keeping power is what he's already spoken of. God's keeping power is intended to bring us to the goal that he has for us, and the goal that he has for us is our final salvation. So when he speaks concerning this power, this salvation that we'll be looking at in just a moment, when he speaks of the keeping power of God, he's speaking of the mighty, miracle-working power that God has. It's, it's the power that will strengthen us, and it's the power he is speaking about that uh, gives us the ability to withstand temptations. Now, we need to remember that Satan uses three very basic ways, and you might want to remember this, and those of you who are new to your faith, Satan uses three very basic ways to entice you and to trap you, three very basic things. And when you read your Bible in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, those three, three things are identified. Uh, he uses the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the sinful pride of life. Those are the three basic things that Satan uses to entice us. Now, when you see that and, and you read the words, the lust of the flesh, well, the lust of the flesh is the desire for things that satisfy our flesh, our fleshly appetites. There's so many scriptures, but I'll give you Galatians 5, 19 through 21 as an illustration. When Paul was writing to the Galatians in chapter 5, he spoke of the works of the acts of the flesh, and he said they are obvious. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and these acts or these works are sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies, and the like. And he went on to say, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are called the works of the flesh. Those are the acts of the flesh. And so he uses the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the flesh can be identified in part by the things I just read to you. Now, that's the device that Satan had used when he enticed Eve to take of the forbidden fruit. What he did is he had drawn her attention to the tree, and she saw, she saw that it was good for food. So it was this desire of her flesh that was used by Satan to deceive her. And that's a temptation that, that Satan even used with Jesus when he told Jesus who had, had uh, not eaten for 40 days. And that was a temptation when he said, if you be God, turn these stones into bread. It was a, a temptation to the flesh. Use God's power to satisfy your own personal hungers. Well, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes is rooted in a sinful desire to possess something that we see. Very often it is, it is expressed through a covetousness that we can have. We covet various things. We can, we can covet somebody's possessions. We can covet somebody's status. It's desiring things, especially material things, with the intent to satisfy our material longings. And so again... Eve saw that the tree was pleasing to the eyes. He, Satan used that tactic when he, he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. His only requirement that he gave to him was that he was to worship, worship Satan. And Satan also used the pride of life to draw us and to defeat us. It's anything that leads us to arrogance or boasting. It's anything that 
results in our presumption. It's a sinful pride, this pride of life. And again, in the case of Eve, she said if she, he said if she partook of that forbidden fruit, you will be like God. Well, Satan wanted to cause Jesus to jump from the pinnacle of the temple, and he inferred that if you would display your power in such a way, you'll gain the world because he had shown him all the kingdoms of the world and said these things have been forfeited basically to me and whomever I want, I can give it to you. And so I'm just telling you, you can have it. So what you need to do is to demonstrate yourself as, um, as God. Jump. Jump from the pinnacle of the temple. The scripture says that he has given his angels charge concerning you and that they shall lift you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And so what he was saying is you can have all these things. You can have a crown without a cross. And the response, obviously, to that kind of temptation is the one that God would have us to have because in the three temptations of Christ, there were three responses. It is written, it is written, it is written. So it's the word of God that God gives to us that overcomes these things. And these are the same temptations that are presented to us. So God's power is necessary to preserve us from the pollution that's in the world. Remember, recently we looked in Jude, the book of Jude, and in verse 24, it reads, He is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. So the keeping power of God is received as well as applied by our faith. To believe is our part. The exertion of the almighty power is of God. And so there's no persevering without the power, and there's no power without faith. So our final and completed salvation, the Apostle Peter is pointing out, has yet to be realized, and that occurs, this final uh, completed salvation occurs when we are with Jesus. Now, he's speaking of this as we begin our study in verse 10, this salvation. And so he goes, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied, notice, of the grace that would come to you. Salvation through Messiah is prophesied by the Old Testament prophets, is what he's saying. Prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, declaring what that prophet had received by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They wrote over 300 specific prophecies revealing future events concerning the kingdom of God, concerning salvation, Jesus' birth, his ministry, his death, as well as his resurrection. So they prophesied in the Old Testament concerning Messiah who was yet to come. And he makes it very clear, and I want you to see this in verse, uh, verse 10. It says, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. They inquired, they searched diligently throughout the Scripture. So the prophets that he's referring to, there's so many, but just to remind you of a few, these prophets that had searched diligently and wanted to know of the Lord and spoke of him uh, would be like Job and David, would be like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, Malachi. They were writers of, the, of uh, prophecies, prophetic things that related to Messiah or spoke concerning things that would take place in the future, and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so they received from the Lord's inspiration by the Spirit, and they passed on the words of God, and they did that through their speech, and they did that through writing. So others would read the Scripture and trusted that the Scriptures were inspired by God. In 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Peter makes that clear. He says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the prophet searched the word to find out the time of Messiah's appearance. Now he speaks concerning the fact, notice again in verse 10, that they inquired and they searched. The word inquire means to seek out. It means to investigate. When it says they searched diligently, it's speaking that they were thorough in this investigation. So they wanted to know, when Messiah was going to arrive on the scene. In Matthew 13, verse 17, Jesus said it like this. He said, Truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. 
So they desired, they inquired, they wanted to know, but it was not revealed to them. Now, they had a belief in the word of God, in the fact that it is revealed, in the fact that it is accurate. Let me share a couple of things about the Bible. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years in times of war, in days of peace, by 40 different writers, including kings and physicians, tax collectors and farmers, fishermen, singers, scholars, and shepherds. It was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and it was written on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. It's a collection of 66 books, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, 66 books that make up the one book, the Bible, Biblos, which is simply a Greek word for the book. Its main theme is the kingdom of God. The entire Bible points to Jesus Christ because Jesus is its main subject and glory to God is what it is designed to produce. And these prophets wrote these things concerning the one who was to come. It's the only religious book that contains prophecy. You can look at any book written that is called a book uh, from God. Any, not one of them has prophecy. That's because God is the inspirer of our Bible. Isaiah 46.10, God says, Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. So these prophets made the study of God's word their highest priority. They longed to see Messiah, and they knew Scripture would direct them. So their diligence in seeking the Lord should provoke us to know Scripture. That should provoke us to read, a, read the word, to listen to teaching, go to studies, to serve. These are the things you learn as you await the Lord's return. Now, notice in verse 10, it says, they prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Now, many had been under the law of Moses. The law of Moses, as we've seen, uh, demanded strict obedience. In, in the Old Testament, Leviticus 18, verse 5, God said, keep my statutes and my judgments, for the man who does these things will live by them. So, under the law of Moses... There was a strict obedience that was demanded of you. Keep them and you will live. So there were promises of life, but also there was promises of judgment. Paul said in Romans 7 verse 10, I discovered that the very commandment that was meant to bring life actually brought death. Why is that? Because none of us can keep the law perfectly. That's why we need the grace of God. That's why we need someone who could. That's why Jesus could say of himself, which of you can convict me of sin? And nobody could. Why? Because he completely and perfectly kept the law of God. And that's why he's our Messiah. Well, these prophets prophesied, notice, of the grace that would be revealed through Jesus. So it's God's grace when applied to our lives that transforms us, and it does so from the inside. Now, some think, even to this day, that the society we live in needs to be reformed. And indeed, the society we live in in our day is getting more and more corrupt. Who would argue against that? There are some who would, but as we look at our society, it is slowly corrupting even more and more. I remember while my mom was still with us, when my mom was still alive, uh, and she was ill, and she was getting to the point where she was going to go to heaven. I remember my mom saying to me, you know, I'm ready. Dave, I just want to get out of this place. It's such a foreign land that I'm living in. It's so different than what it was when I grew up and all of that. And and uh, there are many people who are seeing that even worse now. If my mom were still alive right now, she'd be shocked at what has happened in just a, sh a short time, right? And so there's a lot of people who want to see a reformation. Something has to happen. We need to remember that reform is not the answer for our culture. Redemption is what is needed. And that occurs at the individual, not societal level. The church needs to get back to the real task to which we're called evangelizing the lost. Only when multitudes of individuals in our society turn to Christ will society itself experience any significant transformation. I believe that with all of my heart. You can't reform, but you can change and transform, and that comes through the gospel. So the prophets saw that grace was better than anything under the law. In Galatians 3, in verse 10, 
Paul said, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. It's written, cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do everything written in the book of the law. In John 1.17, though, we see that, that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so they were prophesying concerning the grace, he said, that would come to you. Verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Jesus is the one, and notice in verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was in them. Jesus is the one who inspired them to write concerning Messiah. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ was provoking the writing of scripture. So Jesus worked from within the Old Testament writers to record God's revelation. And the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus because he's the one Scripture points to. Remember Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, in verse 11, the spirit of Christ testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. So the prophets in the Old Testament revealed his incarnation, they revealed his suffering, and they revealed redemption. And that came in a general way. They were giving piecemeal these prophecies, but they didn't know when these things would occur. And that was all given to them by the movement or inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so as they were writing these things, verse 12, to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. To whom it was real, revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering. They were moved to write about Christ, but they didn't fully understand what they were revealing. They were not even permitted to understand their own writings. They didn't know the exact meaning of their writings. But God is still blessing because they were looking forward to the future day when these things would be fulfilled and they'd have clarity. In Hebrews 11:39, it says these, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And so their writings were ministering. It says again in verse 12, to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Again, often the prophets did not understand the meaning of their own predictions. When we went through the book of Ephesians in chapter 3, remember with me what Paul wrote in verses 4 and 6. He said, in reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So they didn't receive, as they're writing these Old Testament prophets, didn't receive the fulfillment of the prophecies. So what they did is they lived in hope. You see, verse 12 says, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you. He's saying the apostles, as well as, as we today, have had the privilege of preaching the gospel that was once hidden. And the gospel, I want you to notice, is preached by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So it's the Holy Spirit who inspired the prophets, and it's the Holy Spirit who inspires all proclaimers of the gospel even to this day. Now, as he's speaking of this salvation, verse 12, these things, these are the things which angels desire to look into. 
They desire to look. That word look is a strong Greek word that speaks of an overpowering curiosity. The angels have an overpowering curiosity concerning God's plan of redemption. I'll say something very briefly if I can do such a thing. Fallen angels cannot be saved. There was somebody who at one time attended our fellowship who contacted me via uh, social media, via Facebook, and he wanted to argue with me, telling me that he believed that Satan was going to ultimately uh, be redeemed, and, and the fallen angels too. And so we had a discussion about that that lasted for a little while because I said, you really need to read the Bible because the enemy ends up in the lake of fire forever. It tells us exactly what happens to him. And I told him also, I said, listen, I said, uh, fallen angels remain fallen. There's no redemption for angels. Angels don't understand salvation. They desire to look into because they have an overpowering curiosity as to what redemption actually is. Why? Because once an angel falls, he has fallen for eternity. And he at one time, though referred to as an angel, he is part of the original creation, the angels. When they fell, their, their names were changed from the angels, the messengers. It was changed to the devils, diabolos. They were adversaries. They were contenders. They, they, they're, they're evil and they remain that way. And so the angels desire to understand something they never can experience. And so the angels who did not fall still don't really understand the amazing love that God could have for such pathetic creatures as us. And they don't and, and they desire to look into that, to understand that. They don't understand grace and salvation. Because in their order, in their, the created order of angels, there is no redemption. You fell, you remain fallen. You didn't fall, you remain unfallen. But there is something they will do. Ultimately, they're going to sing songs of praise for the salvation that God worked for man. Revelation 5 tells us in verse 11 and 12, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. They're going to have a glimpse into that as they see what God has done in salvation. And the angels learn of the work of salvation by seeing how God has saved us and made the church. Paul made that clear in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 10, when he said his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. And so they'll gain an understanding of the grace of God, not in a personal sense, but by seeing how God has ministered to those who have been lost and yet are now found. And with this in mind, verse 13, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. In light of the fact that salvation is so incredible, Peter is saying, angels desire to look in this. Prophets didn't even understand it. But you've received the grace of God. You've received the grace that has called you instead of just creatures. You are now children of God himself. And, and you ought to be rejoicing over the reality of that. And in, 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 in the face of how Incredible salvation is. Cling tightly to the Lord Jesus Christ. In light of the belief in, in, in works righteousness, you need to understand that your works did not make you righteous. You need to understand that there are false gospels. And this is what he's going to be speaking more clearly about later on. You need to understand that there are false gospels that begin to put salvation, um, rest, it rests on your efforts. No, no, you need 
to rest completely, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Rest fully on God's grace. Don't get caught up trying to make yourself good because you can't. You may be able to, I may be able to make myself appear to be better than some other lowly sinner. I might be able to. Every one of us has a friend or two that we can point to and say, well, at least I'm not that bad. We kind of collect them sometimes. <laughs> I'm not that bad. I was that guy. <laughs> Hold on to the grace of God. I want you to see something here. Verse 13, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you. That is a place, I don't have this in my notes, so I'm going to share something with you for a moment from my heart. Rest yourself completely on the hope. The hope. We are saved by hope. I see hopelessness overtaking a lot of believers. I didn't prepare this. I, I, I should do a whole study on what I'm trying to say right now in just a couple minutes. But if there's anything that I saw happen as we have had the last recent years, the last few recent events and times, there has been a concerted effort. I believe that there is a spiritual component. There's no doubt about it. To cause the church to have no more hope. To live in fear. And hopelessness. All you need to do is take a moment to look around the world that we live in right now. And I don't want to be a downer, but that's true. <laughs> to see what's going on without me telling you a lot of things you already know. The disrespect for authority. You know, the use of fear with the disease. The lockups that took place that took away Christians from fellowship and the fear that many Christians began to live under, the anxiety, and you can lose hope. You could think that life is not worth living anymore. And you can get to the point, even as a believer, where you just am tired. You're just tired. I just don't want to do this anymore. I just can't do this anymore. I'm tired. I got a, an email yesterday. A dear friend of mine committed suicide just yesterday. Couldn't sleep for a year. So tired. And finally he just decided, no more. No more. I can't do this anymore. I see that. I see that. There's always hope. Jesus is our hope. And he gives us hope. And the enemy cannot defeat Jesus Christ. <sighs> Marie and I, we have in the last couple of weeks been dealing with so many different things. The church is erupting, not this church, churches in general that we're familiar with and that we minister in. And there's so much, there's so much sin that is being welcomed in. And the more you imbibe in, in sin, the more guilt you live in, the less hope you have. It's undermining. We need to rest fully our hope in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there's ever been a time when the church needs to awaken, it's right now. It's right now. We have the answer in Christ. Be very careful because the enemy is whispering into the ears of so many people. There's no hope. And that's just a lie from the devil. Jesus is my hope. And, 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 and I live because he lives. And, and, and though it may look bad right now, it doesn't stay bad. We used to say it was trite to say it then. I'll say it now. I read the last page of the Bible. We win in Christ. I, I read that. We win. And we have, we have to hold on. And, and we, need to, we need to gird up, he says, the loins of our mind. We need to, it, it, it's a picture of gathering up your robe. It, it speaks of 
removing hindrances that create obstacles as you're running or as you're fighting this fight. When he says, gird up your loins, uh, it's a call to action. He's saying, you need to be prepared. You need to be serious. You need to endure whatever is necessary as you live in and proclaim the grace of God. You need to be sober. That speaks of being self-controlled. You need to use sound judgment in every area of your life. It could speak of uh, physical cares of life. Like he says in Romans 13, 13, uh, we belong to the day. We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Uh, be self-controlled in the cares of this life. Also be uh, uh, understanding in your thought and in, and in the way that your will is used. Be in a constant state, in other words, of awareness, because the enemy is setting traps to take you. That's why Ephesians 5 is so important, where Paul in verses 15 and 16 says, uh, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, re redeeming the time. The days are evil. Rest, he says, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you. In faith, trust the Lord and rest in his grace. Wait expectantly, and you'll see Jesus. God's grace is actually a place that you rest in. And, and your rest is a result of, of, of understanding what Christ has done, and it produces a life that people see and say, you live a set-apart life. You live a holy life. In verse 14, he speaks in this way. He says, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. Not being what you used to be. Don't live like you used to before you were saved. Don't let your flesh dominate. By the power of God's Holy Spirit, you can be obedient children. Why is that? Well, we'll close with these words. He who called you is holy, and you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. As our Father in heaven is holy, so are his, his children. What does it mean to be holy? It speaks of being separated from that which is unholy or profane. It speaks of being dedicated to God. It speaks of conforming to God's command. There's a writer that uh, wrote something I thought was worthy of quoting. His name is Edwin Lutzer, and he said this. He said, Within evangelicalism is a distressing drift towards accepting a Christianity that doesn't demand a life-changing walk with God. Many evangelicals today do not realize that the church has always been an island of righteousness in a sea of paganism, but as a result, they turned the world upside down. We need to realize that in the walk that we have that is called holy, it's a set-apart life, it impacts people. Holiness isn't an old-fashioned concept of being proud of what you don't do. Holiness is the result of loving Jesus Christ and spending time with him. Holiness is, is a desire to please him, a desire to please him that motivates us to reject sin in Hebrews 12, verse 14, he, the writer says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So this desire to please God is why you reject the norms of the society that accepts sin. Listen, living together is still fornication. Same-sex marriage is still forbidden and not recognized as marriage. Men are still men. And women are still women, and he and she are the only pronouns that we need. But we're living in a world that is changing our culture by forcing us to adapt to their twisted way of thinking. So the scripture set us free. And so it, it costs. There's a cost that's exacted. People like me are called backwards, hillbillies, idiots. And that's from my friends. The world is even worse. So our understanding of what pleases God doesn't allow us to evolve. 
It doesn't allow us to compromise. In Romans 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. So we live in holiness, a reverential fear of the Lord, and it purifies our life. Why? Because our God is holy, our God is righteous, and we glorify him best when our lives conform to his. Proverbs 16, verse 6 says, Mercy and truth, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged by the fear of the Lord. Men depart from evil. Why is the church going in the way that it's going? Some of you perhaps saw this. It was in, in social media, and we're going to go a couple minutes longer. I can tell you that right now. But I'll tell you this. Um, perhaps you saw this in social media. There was a particular uh, church that had a men's conference recently, and they had a guy on a pole um, he, you know, I saw, I saw, it was sent to me, and he, he rips off his shirt, and he climbs on a pole and all of that, and the speaker who came up right after this guy had, this guy apparently had introduced the men's conference with this act, and it's supposed to be men, be, be men of our times or whatever, and the speaker who came up after uh, rebuked, he rebuked the people, he said, what you have right now? He says, not a preparation to receive from the Lord. He said, what you've done, and I'm paraphrasing what you've done, is you have yielded to the spirit of this age. And um, I have to tell you, I, was, I, I wasn't quite sure exactly if I agreed to every point he was making. The points he made, I, it's, I could see why he was saying it. But he was right about that. He was saying, when you, when you open up, yourself, uh, open up a, a conference to tell men how to be men, and encourage men to be men, and you start with a, guy in a pole, um, don't you realize that you started out with carnality and you're not going to end up in the spirit? And so what happens is the quote-unquote pastor who, had, who was holding that convention, that conference, rebuked this guy and um, told him to leave the stage. He didn't want to hear. Um, This isn't a time to play. The world is going to hell. Men are being told that we're not necessary. Men are being told it's, it's, it's yelled to us. You don't matter. You're not needed. All you do is donate uh, the sperm that makes children, but we really don't need you. We don't need you. We don't need anything you do. And you hear that, it's yelled at. I've heard that so many times. We don't mean men. And a lot of, unfortunately, women who call themselves liberated are saying that. And men are being beaten down by the spirit of this age. But men, we need you. We, meet, we need you to stand up now in this day and show what a man really is. We really need you. The church needs you. It's, a to it's time. It's time. The men need to realize who we are. We are created in the image of God. God has placed in a position of authority. We need to exercise that authority. We need to lead our homes. We need to, to be men that other men can see and use as a model. We ought to be the kind of men that, that God can point to and say, that's my son. We, we need to be like our father. And, uh, and fellas, you know, I just want to speak as a man to other men. You know, this is the time to be ready for war. This is the time. And we need to stand up, not meanly, not evilly, not brutally, just be men, just be strong and, and, and dedicate yourself to God. And when you do that, you will lead your family. When you do that, you're going to find resistance when you do that. But guess what? You hold fast because you're going to be the man. If you're married, you're going to be the man that your wife wanted to marry. You're going to be the man she wanted to lead the home. She wanted you to be strong. She wanted that. And something happened. But guess what? The word of God tells me, be holy for I am holy. I'm going to live a life that inspires, that inspires my wife, that inspires my children, that inspires my church. I want to live a life that God is pleased with. And because he is holy, 
The church is to be holy. And I rest my hope fully on the return of Jesus Christ in anticipation of seeing him because he's coming at any time now. The days are short. We have little time to act. And we need to, we need to gird ourselves. We need to take up the sword. It's time for war. We need to be ready. And we need to be willing. And we need to be used by God in these dark times. People are looking to men to be men. Let's stand up and be that for the kingdom of God. Let us pursue the things of the Lord. It's very important.